Hello, everyone. This is Greg Drevenstead, Editor-in-Chief at Writer Magazine and your host for the Writer Magazine Insider Podcast. Our guest today is Daniel Calderon. Daniel is Curator of Exhibitions at SFO Museum. Daniel, welcome to the show. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate you having me. So uh, some folks may know some of our readers, but in the May 2021 issue of Rider, we published a feature about an exhibit currently on display at SFO Museum called Early American Motorcycles. So tell us about the museum and tell us about the exhibit. Oh boy, I guess I can start with the museum. We're um, the, kind of in a special spot. We're the only museum in an airport that's accredited by the American uh, Alliance of Museums, which means we're, uh, you know, we're held up there with Smithsonian standards. We've uh, started in 1980. We've been here since 1980. We've got uh, exhibitions in uh, numerous, I think over 30 different galleries right now, including the uh, photo galleries all over the terminals. Uh, we've got a standalone uh, aviation museum and gallery and um, a library also that uh, uh, does their own exhibits. We've got a permanent exhibition on the China Clipper. Um, just really a wide variety of things that we do. Um, separate into two major departments, we've got aviation folk with a focus on um, commercial aviation and uh, our curators draw from around a quarter million different items in the permanent collection. Wow. I'm one of two curators that work for the non-aviation part of the museum, which, uh, which means that we're, um, we're not drawing necessarily from the permanent collection. Every once in a while, I like to dip in and out if I can find something that, um, that makes sense to show. But uh, for the most part, we're really at the mercy of the public, the private collections, other museums, whatever we can find that we think is interesting and educational, um, we can do an exhibit on it. So that's... Um, so uh, just so some people may know, since SFO is uh, the, the abbreviation for the San Francisco International Airport, so this is a, um, a museum. It, it Does it have a separate dedicated space within the airport? Is this something that uh, visitors could see the museum if they weren't going to be on their way to or from uh, they weren't doing any air travel. Is this something that you can access without having to go through security? How does this, how's the museum set up? Absolutely. We've got, to, you know, COVID's complicated things a little bit with COVID and construction. Our aviation museum and library, which is an international terminal, is uh, is, is usually open. Right now it's um, closed for uh, for construction and pending, um, uh, you know, things getting back to normal from COVID. So normally that's open, that will be open again soon. Um, Early American Motorcycles is in a terminal. It's an international terminal pre-security. So uh, people are welcome to visit. We're open 24 seven, technically. You could really visit that, you know, whether you are flying, you know, uh, uh, from you know, Mumbai or something at three in the morning, or, you know, just on your motorcycle at two in the afternoon and want to stop by. So uh, we've got another couple of um, galleries that are opening pre-security and international terminal in the next few months. Uh, a few other galleries that are behind security, photo galleries all over the place. The museum itself is uh, uh, a little bit mysterious, I think, sometimes for people who know what we do. I've uh, I've mentioned, you know, almost seems like whenever I mention that I work for SFO Museum to somebody who's seen the exhibits in the terminals, they are um, really surprised that like there are people that work there like there's actually a museum because I mean we have these wonderful exhibitions and I think they're they're done at such a um, such a professional level that they just seem to I don't know, kind of always be there I guess but we do rotate them out you know about every eight months or so and we do that with a crew of uh, we've got a little over I think a full-time staff of about 20 people right now wow. that work about half a mile away from the terminals on, on the airport property uh, we do everything in house. Um, you know, I'm one of one of four curators. We've got I think five registrars who see to all the different aspects of um, of the loan, you know, and shipping and insurance and paperwork and all of that and condition reporting. You've got a full time arts conservator on staff. We've got a couple of graphic artists, full time photographer. We've got a whole crew of um, uh, preparators who make all the different mounts and um, furniture and. Uh, full-time exhibit designer. I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody. Really, everything you see in the exhibits actually made right down the way at the airport in a dedicated museum facility. So, 
So well, I, you know, and it's interesting. I live down in the Los Angeles area. I've lived in California for about 14 years. I've flown through SFO. I've flown, you know, even internationally. Um, I didn't know that there was a museum there. I may have passed part of the uh, an exhibit at some point and and was just on my way to a flight or something. So um, to have a like you said a full fledged accredited museum within an airport, like you said, that sounds like that's a very unique situation. And interestingly, is I found out about this ex motorcycle exhibit. Somebody uh, sent us an email to the magazine and just said, "Hey, you might want to check this out." And I was like, "Wait." There's a motorcycle exhibit at a museum I didn't know that exists at this airport. <laughs> and then I went to your website and you mentioned you've got a full time photographer. So uh, this particular exhibit, uh, I, I want you to go into the, some of the details on how you got the bikes, but it's 14 vintage motorcycles built before 1916. And then you mm -hmm. have some supporting materials and, and displays. But you have an online catalog where you have these beautifully um, done studio photography of these motorcycles that, again, there are. Uh, there are some Harley Davidsons, there's a couple Indians, there are some of these uh, motorcycle brands that I know before the Great Depression, there were 300 different ma motorcycle manufacturers in the United States, and now we largely have two, and mm -hmm. Harley Davidson Indian existed back then and were two of the biggest, but, you know, there's a fly, we've got Flying Merkel, we've got uh, Excelsior, we've got Jefferson, uh, Ivor Johnson, those are just a few of the, the motorcycle brands that are featured in this exhibit that no longer exists. So an exhibit like this, not only being able to display them, but with the photography and the materials in the catalog, uh, you're really preserving history. And so uh, this, I, I was just been really fascinated. I haven't had a chance to see it in person, but tell us a little bit about how this particular exhibit came about and you gathered all of these uh, materials that not only are in the exhibit, but in your catalog. The, uh, the exhibit came about the way we, we tend to formulate exhibits in a couple of different ways. Uh, people will, or museums will either approach us with uh, an idea or a great collection, and then the exhibit will happen that way. Um, sometimes we'll have an idea and then we'll have to go out and actually find the stuff to put on exhibit, which uh, something like early American motorcycles is uh, easier said than done. <laughs> it's a pretty, pretty tall chore to find these things. And we got really, really lucky. Um, as long story short, we uh, I was I was working on an exhibition of um, of typewriters of all things, which actually turned out to be one of my favorite exhibitions. We tend to do these. We're really great at taking something that you wouldn't think might warrant an exhibit, and then just really bringing it to life. Um, while I was working on uh, the typewriter exhibit, I was down at the. Um, let's see, I guess we have to go back before, yeah, really before Chris. I was down at History San Jose. And looking through their collection, looked at the typewriters, and then just looking at other things because we're always trying to come up with you know other ideas as well. And they had these early American bikes. They had a, a single Excelsior, I think it was about ten or so, and they had a fifteen um, a Harley Davidson eleven, uh, really really similar to the bike we have in the exhibit. Uh, Reading Standard um, had a Belgian FN four, which is a a pretty neat bike. Um, what was the other? I think they had, they had an emblem, a really original emblem as well. And I just remember thinking, like, I was just struck by these machines because they're, I mean, they're massively rare. They're just so collectible and so rare, and you barely ever see them outside of a, you know, of a museum. And it kind of just struck a chord and sat in the back of my mind until another um, tour looking for the um, uh, uh, typewriters again, this time at the Museum of American Heritage out in Palo Alto. And uh, the Jim Wall over there, their director introduced me to Chris Carter, who was on their board. I started talking to Chris and found out that he was a, you know, big motorcycle guy and just kind of had a chat and then mentioned the motorcycle thing to Jim. And Jim said, well, you really should, you know, contact Chris if you want to do that. So uh, I reached out to Chris and just the, I can't say enough about Chris Carter, just the nicest guy, really, really passionate about um, all things motorcycles and was really instrumental in making this this whole thing happen. He opened up his collection. Um, that's where the, the Jefferson that's in the exhibit came from. And then he introduced us to um, uh, Wes Allen and um, uh, went up to visit Wes and Wes opened up his collection. And after I saw Chris's collection and Wes's collection, you know, I knew we, we had the, almost like a critical mass like the necessary momentum to really put the rest of the exhibit together and um, talk to my colleagues and they loved the idea. and. 
kind of happened from there. From from there is just really a matter of fine tuning things. Sure. Well, you know, for uh, those that aren't don't know Chris Carter, he's you know he as a uh, former uh, racer, he's been won a gold medal in the ISDT. He is a founder of Motion Pro Tools, which is kind of the the um, tool candy of everybody that uh, has a shop and is a gearhead. They make a lot of really cool specialized tools for for motorcycles. So to have somebody like that that has a collection of bikes, and then of course collectors tend to know other collectors. Exactly. Like, oh, you've got to talk to this guy. He's got this bike, and so forth. So um, there were a couple other people that uh, I think were were involved uh, for because I know you've got some historical materials. Like you know the way that these exhibits are are laid out is as they're um, uh, they're kind of long panels and they're a lot of it is behind glass like you said this is open mm -hmm. 24 hours a day so it's got to be where people you know aren't going to do anything to it it's got to have uh, you know got to protect these these historic materials but you've got some um uh they're they're not necessarily banners but they're these uh, sort of tap not a tapestry but i'm not sure the word i'm looking for uh, the panels in the back of the exhibit that are from the mm -hmm. what is it from the san francisco motorcycle club San Francisco Motorcycle Club lent uh, lent a few uh, few items, uh, mostly images, really great rare images from the uh, you know Bay Area early motorcycling, and the um, the two back walls are um, they're panoramas. One's from a ride in Livermore, and I think it was 1911, and then the other was taken. We believe it was a promotional shot for Thor Motorcycles. It's in front of the Thor Motorcycles dealership. Um, the owner was an old uh, um, San Francisco Motorcycle Club member, one of the founding members, and that was from about 1910 or so. Uh, reproduced them almost life size, so they just provide this really great backdrop for the rest of the bikes. And then we've got uh, a lot of their images on deck. Uh, another lender for the images was uh, Don Emdy, you know, another very well-known racer. He, he and his father, I think, were the only father or son to ever win the when the Daytona, is it the 200? It was the Daytona. 200, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, they both won Daytona. Um, he's got uh, a really fantastic book at Speed Kings that came out a couple of years ago. He let some, let some images, uh, some of the racing stuff and some credits from, from Speed Kings. Um, I also found, um, it's really interesting the way that we find these things. It's always, it can really be surprising in the best ways. I was looking for, images towards the end of um, developing the exhibition and uh, happened upon uh, Chris Summer Simmons book, The American Motorcycle Girls. And I was just, I mean, really struck me. I couldn't believe that this thing existed, that there's this really wonderful compilation of images of, you know, women riding motorcycles back to the, you know, late 1800s. Uh, contacted Chris, she was, again, just really stoked and very enthusiastic, opened up her image collection and also offered up her, um, couple of her bikes as well that Ivor Johnson in the exhibit and then that uh, no, 15 uh, Harley 11 F that she nicknamed Effie that she's ridden the cannonball three times on so uh, look, well, looking for images um, kind of into like a real treasure treasure chest is some awesome motorcycles you know and that's interesting because uh, you know uh, the um, the cannonball rally the transcontinental cannonball that happens usually every couple of years I think it's been it was postponed last year because of COVID or yeah. it's been delayed but but you know this is you know a, a rally traveling cross country on it it's typically motorcycles built before you know again like your exhibit before 1916 before 1920 that I think the age range uh, varies over time but these are motorcycles that are traveling thousands of miles over the course of multiple days and um, that it's their original machines and they've got to be maintained and preserved and fixed and repaired and so forth along the way. So that she did that on one, that same motorcycle three times is pretty three times, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, Chris, uh, is a, uh, uh, is Summer Simmons is a AFA, AMA hall of fame member, uh, you know, somebody like Don MD, um, these are folks that, and Don, Don, I know has a, He's also very much a historian. You know, he's mm -hmm. written some books and he's in, been involved with the uh, kind of the Cannonball Baker to sort of preserve his legacy because he was, you know, set a record crossing the country uh, on a motorcycle way before we had the paved roads and so forth that we have now. So uh, it's interesting that you know there's 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 a there's the living history of something like the Cannonball, but then there is the preservation and restoration of some of these machines that, like I said, that you have that 
you, they're really beautiful. I mean, these are some motorcycles that were early, you know, board track racers, or they were, you know, just this is the origins of the motorcycle industry. They are some of them are essentially motorized bicycles because that's how we got started with motorcycles. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you're 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 a gearhead. I know you, you may not be. Uh, you've ridden motorcycles. You're not necessarily motorcycles. But what what kind of things do you work on in your spare time? Oh. Boy, I've had a, I've still got my first car bought when I was 16. It's a, a 1955 Ford Custom Line. So I've restored that a couple of times. Uh, learned the hard way. You never want to restore a vehicle until you have a garage for it. <laughs> Hold off on all that uh, chrome work and paint work until you can, you can put it inside. But uh, just lucky to still have it. The Daily Driver was a 62 Comet uh, for years after that. Still got that. Um, I've got an old uh, 1960 Cessna 172 that um, I, I fixed up with some help and fly that around a little bit. Wow. Um, good friends of mine are into um, airplane racing, International Formula One airplane racing. We're a class up at the Reno Air Races that they, they have up there at Steadfield every September. I've been um, on the crew with them for uh, um, about eight years now, Justin Phillipson and Josh Phillipson and um, no strings attached and uh, wow. um, labor a little cassette and the shoestring that they they built and I was able to actually go up there to the shop in Chico and um, help with the help with the build. And... Well, I mean, that makes sense. If you are a, a gearhead, you, you know, worked on cars, worked on, you know, planes, uh, is that, you know, like you said, you were at this, uh, this other museum, you were getting materials for uh, an exhibit about typewriters, but you've got the eye for you see something and it catches your eye. It's like, there's an important piece of history uh, these early motorcycles, you knew they were rare. And then, I mean, that's, that's how things get started. You know, that's like, it's mm -hmm. the, it's the germ of an idea. And I mean, talk about some, I mean, you said, I, I know you've done some really fascinating exhibits over the years at SFO, mm -hmm. um, surfboard, surf music, uh, you know, hairstyle. I mean, tell us a little bit about what some of these exhibits were. <laughs> we're kind of all over the place. The last, the last uh, motorcycle exhibit that we did I think it was back in 2011. I wasn't part of it. It was Moda Bellissima. It's on small bore Italian bikes. Wow. We, we, we um, had a little bit of motorcycles in our past. And I think people were really excited to see them again. Um, more recently, the, um, the surfboards exhibit was great. That was a really fun one to do. Um, that came from uh, a couple of different collections. Um, it was a project that was a, um, sort of a, a shaper named Larry Fuller. And he started a project to gather together um, some of the most famous uh, surfboard shapers in history and combine their uh, current talents with some of the most rare woods in the world. So mm. we've got like, uh, like Renny Yader. I think a lot of people have heard of Yader surfboards, even if you're not into surfing. We had a um, Yader longboard that was hand shaped from Sequoia Redwood. Oh, wow. Massively rare wood to find. Like go on and on about that one. Uh, right now we've got an exhibit on um, instrumental rock and roll and surf music. Just something that I put together. It's a real fun one. Uh, my colleague Nicole Mullen put together an uh, exhibition on um, hairstyles, women's hairstyles, and the history of of, of women's hair, which is uh, it's another really fun educational exhibit. So, you know, if you're a curious person, I imagine like you've kind of got the great, the perfect job for somebody who has wide ranging interests and curiosity. You and your your colleagues. So Daniel, I know that you put together some educational materials for your exhibits, uh, which is a way for people that uh, maybe not be able to see the exhibit in person, but those are widely available th through your website. So tell us a little bit about how you put those together. Uh, every year we pick at least two exhibits to, um, uh, to feature for our educational program. Uh, motorcycles is just a, a really easy pick because the, I think the, the machines are so, so visually interesting and there are some fantastic stories behind these motorcycles. You know, they, they really speak to, to creativity and um, engineering. And um, there's just so many, I think so many wonderful people who have been involved with these machines. Um, it was a real surprise to see women in motorcycling so early on, very, very much welcomed in motorcycling ever since its inception. Um, I think it. Uh, there's just a lot of inspirational stories that um, kids can. I think kids can really, really learn from, and it's especially important right now. With uh, you know, I think kids are finally getting back to school, but with all the restrictions with COVID, you know, if, if you can't exactly get school tours out here to see the exhibit, parents can at least uh, show them through these things online, and they're all available um, as a free 
a downloadable PDF. It's kind of an extended format of our catalog for, for children. Well, that's great. I mean, you know, as somebody who works at a motorcycle magazine, I'm always, we'd love to see more and more young people take an interest in motorcycles, uh, you know, so that they can become motorcyclists when they get older. And, exactly. uh, you know, I, I know whenever I'm out riding a motorcycle and I'm at a stoplight and there's a crosswalk, anytime little kids walk by, they're always just big, you know, eyes are like saucers and staring at it. So to be able to have not just a, 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 a museum catalog, but to package things together or organize things into some true educational materials aimed at, uh, at young people is a great service. So um, you mentioned that you wanted to talk about a, a Wyman motorcycle with her. Yeah, the way that um, it's really, I think, I think it's interesting the way that we find these bikes. You know, sometimes we'll meet somebody amazing like Chris, who has a lot of connections and will uh, very generously uh, share, you know, people like Wes Allen and Nancy, Nancy Matthews and, and the people that, um, that he knows and, you know, site visits and kind of word of mouth um, are all different ways that we find these machines. Uh, getting into the research on the motorcycles and the research and the writing, I found the uh, George Wyman Memorial Project. George Wyman was the, um, the first person to travel cross country on any kind of motorized vehicle. He actually um, predated the, um, the um, I forget the guy's name, it's at the Smithsonian. There was a Witten automobile that made the trip about two months later. Um, that got all the press. Witten got all the press. People kind of forgot about George Wyman. But at any rate, in 1903, George Wyman rode across the United States from San Francisco to New York on a, you know, one and I think it was like a one and a quarter, quarter horsepower California motor bicycle. I, before roads were in most places. He followed railroad tracks a lot of the time. The, there was a, the motorcycle magazine actually published his um, exploits for, uh, for a few months and that's all available online via the George Wyman project. Just absolutely fascinating story. But at any rate, I'm looking through all of this and um, I noticed that they uh, had a little bit on somebody named Dave Scafone who apparently owned George Wyman's motorcycle. So started doing our, uh, we, you know, we can go pages deep on Google. It's like <laughs> one of the things we do as curators here. And I, I, I found Dave and he was surprised to hear from us, but uh, just a real great collector as well and uh, invited me over and uh, generously opened it up as his, his collection to us. And we borrowed the, um, what's, we're 90% sure it's George Wyman's original 1903 California. It was owned by um, Otis Chandler who was um, a collector and uh, the publisher of the Los Angeles Times for many years. Uh, Chandler found it in the 70s and restored it. And when he restored it, the pictures of the rest, it was a real basket case and the pictures of the restoration haven't been found yet. So there are a few clues that we're hoping to find that will prove it to be his bike hundred percent. But uh, you know, until somebody says it's, it's not and I'm going, I'm going with it. So <laughs> amazing to have have that machine in the exhibit. And then Dave also lent his, you know, he's got his uh, racing bikes and a lot of other things in the exhibit. So uh, probably one of the coolest motorcycles I've ever heard of in the world led to um, some other really, really great loans that are out there on display right now. Well, and that's the thing about collectors is, you know, it's, it's not just about, you know, people wanting to own valuable things. It's that these are uh, many of the times these collectors are true enthusiasts that are very obsessive about the details and and trying to verify the authenticity of a particular motorcycle or collectible object or something like that. Um, you know, because yeah, George Wyman's story is one of great perseverance. I, you know, I think I read that, you know, he had went hundreds of miles with, you know, a busted handlebar or something that he was just, mm -hmm. you know, he was having to uh, do what we would call MacGyvering, you know, all along way before MacGyver in the 1900s, because as you said, you know, there's, there aren't gas stations, there aren't service stations, there's hardly any roads, there's, in the west, there's a lot of sand, there's mountain ranges you have to go over, and to do it on a motorcycle that has uh, less horsepower than most push lawnmowers or something like mm -hmm. that is, is pretty, pretty re remarkable, and to have these, you know, these motorcycles preserved by individuals and collectors, and they change hands over time, uh, but to be able to that's what I always thought is, is fascinating about a museum exhibit. I went to the Art of the Motorcycle exhibit at the Guggenheim in 1998. I've been to some other museums is that is to have all of the, the motorcycles or items in an exhibit brought together because it really reflects 
your vision, the vision of other curators, everybody on your team where, you know, nobody will ever bring an exhibit together in exactly the same way. All of, you know, a motorcycle may be in more than one exhibit over its history, but all of the particular bikes that you brought together uh, and the theme that you have with their, their, their uh, you know, pre-1916, uh, the historic materials and photographs from the San Francisco Motorcycle Club, which is one of the oldest motorcycle clubs in, in America. I mean, it truly is, as I've said several times, this is kind of the, this is the genesis of the motorcycle um, industry and the, and the hobby and, uh, you know, what uh, enthusiasts like us can take for granted because it, it all started, you know, back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So, so yeah, this is a fascinating exhibit. I really hope to see it in person. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the folks that we had on a podcast in an earlier episode is uh, Paul Dorleone. He curated a guest curated a motorcycle exhibit for the Peterson Automotive Museum down in Los Angeles. And mm -hmm. The Peterson had a similar challenge that I think every museum has had, which is that they had to close during the pandemic and, yeah. you know, and, and um, uh, tickets and, you know, attendance by uh, visitors is an important part of revenue for many museums. So they had to sort of pivot as, as many uh, organizations have done. And they offered a lot of online educational materials. And again, it's part of it is because, you know, not everybody can physically visit a museum in person for one reason or another. It's just, you know, we're, we're busy in life. So that you can have an exhibit and then also have these supporting materials, um, whether they're accessible online, you know, you can purchase a catalog, like I said, if, if it's a, occasionally in print. Um, you know, I work for a magazine and it's, it's an honor to be able to have uh, the stories of um, various authors and columnists and features that we put together preserved in a monthly magazine every month. And you uh, have been very generous in sharing uh, your, your photographs and materials. I know Ken Lee did the interview with you to be able to share this with our readers because again, we have a, a, an audience that's all over the country. We have some Canadian readers and so forth that may or may not be able to attend this exhibit. So really wanted to showcase them because these are beautiful machines in a lot of ways. And uh, in the article, we refer people to the to the sfomuseum.org. Is that the, the proper web address? SFO I believe so. I can go navigate over here to, yeah, the sfomuseum.org. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure we have a, a link in the show notes, but that people can go in and see because we obviously weren't able to include all of the materials that you have in your online catalog or on your website. Uh, so that folks can go check these out because you've got some fascinating historic photos, you've got some backstory. Um, our sister publication, uh, Thunder Press, uh, also uh, uh, is running a version of this story in its May issue um, that uh, provides a little bit more insight into the, what makes each of these motorcycles unique because like I said, there are 14 motorcycles and, and they are the sort of building blocks of uh, the motorcycle industry and the motorcycles that we ride today. So to be mm -hmm. able to preserve those is, is great and to, to share them with others. So um, how long is this exhibit planned uh, to stay open if somebody was able to go see it in person at the uh, SFO airport? It's through uh, through September, double check the date here, through September 19th. Okay. The, um, the, all the supporting materials will, um, will you know remain online. So we've got that, uh, the website will be live and um, you know people can get to the parents want to get to the educational brochure to to use for um, the, the, those purposes they can and the catalog will be online and all, all of that will um, live as long as we have the website there yeah that's great yeah that's well that's one of the the, the great things about you know uh, you know the internet and websites is that you can have things that you can go back and refer to that uh, you know for, you know years later and as somebody will stumble across it with some sort of internet uh search and um so you know i hope like i said i haven't been uh on an airplane in over a year myself uh and uh but uh, a ride up the coast to san francisco is always something enjoyable so if i have an opportunity to get up uh, there and see the museum uh before september i certainly will i would love to check it out in person uh because yeah, yeah. there's something about seeing you know like i said Seeing photographs is great. There's something about excellent photography, but to see something, because it's also, it's the way that you organize those materials and you have um, um, you have ID cards and I'm sure there's a lot of, you know, and just to sit there and go from from um, item to item and read, you know, kind of cover to cover or end to end would, would be fascinating, so, yeah. Yeah, it'd be a great daytime ride for somebody or a group of people and um, it's, 
really nice to see passenger travel ramping back up. Every time I go out to the terminals, there are more and more people out of there, you know, that are fly, flying through. And um, so I think all of that is, um, all of that's on, on, on the up and up. Great. Can you give us a sneak peek of uh, what sort of exhibits you may be working on? Or is that something you truly keep those kind of under under wraps until you're... Oh, no, I've got... Uh, let's see, what have I been doing today? I've got uh, an exhibit on uh, flight attendant uniforms from the mid-60s through the early 70s. Some really bright, bold, just crazy wild uh, uh, flight attendant uniforms that we're, uh, we're, we're putting into a brand new gallery that uh, we're getting in... Um, wow, it's already May in a few weeks here, so that'll be coming up. Uh, we've got an exhibit on uh, antique scientific instruments that mm -hmm. we're presenting um, later this, this this fall from a, a singular collection that um, looked like it was too good to be true, but we went and did a site visit and it's not, and the lender's fantastic, so that, that'll be a fun one as well. Cool. Well, well hey, uh, Daniel, again, you've been generous with uh, the materials for this exhibit, sharing it with our readers, uh, with Thunder Press readers. You've been generous with your time today. Uh, you know, thank you. Uh, we will, as I said, have a link to uh, the museum website in uh, the show notes. And um, I appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Greg. So uh, for uh, Writer Magazine Insider Podcast, this is Greg Drevenstead. Uh, thanks for listening and keep the rubber side down. If you've enjoyed listening to the Writer Magazine Insider Podcast, please subscribe leave us a positive rating and tell your friends. We also encourage you to visit ridermagazine.com where you can get the latest in motorcycle news and reviews and sign up for our free weekly newsletter. You can also subscribe to print and digital editions of Rider Magazine, which is published 12 times a year. Thanks again for listening. 